Hello and welcome to DIY, uh, Indie Musicians Talking Music. I'm Martin Hawley, and today I'm talking with Joe Peacock. How's it going, Joe? Yeah, good. Thanks, Martin. Um, so Joe, Joe reached out to me. Well, we talked earlier and we'd agreed to do something, but Joe just reached out to me because you're, you're going to be releasing an album quite soon. Um, That's right, yeah. Why don't we start with that? So, so what, what is the title of your album? I wasn't sure you, you sort of sent me a, 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 a sort of a pre-release version, but I never mm -hmm. presume with these things because I know from my personal experience that sometimes things change. Uh -huh. So, so what, what, what's, what are you going to be titling it? So it's called Mirror Neuron Generator. And why? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I came across this um, thing about uh, mirror neurons, which are right. basically uh, something in the brain that um, reacts to to things that you hear or you see uh, and, and gives you those kind of feelings of, of how it would be for you if that happened. So, uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing that I try to do with my storytelling in my songs is to to create some kind of empathy amongst the, the listener and, uh, and to try and get them to put themselves in the position of the, the people in the stories, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Well, uh, that's actually an excellent well. title. Yeah, with, thank with you. The explanation. <laughs> now, is there going to be an explanation on the packaging, or <laughs> no? <Nah, laughs> or are we going to be playing this? You're going to be playing your explanation in a loop, or yeah. So this is the first time we've explained it to anyone. Nobody's actually asked before, so uh, yeah. <laughs> the the title's been out there for a few days, and I was just ex assuming everyone was incredibly smart and uh, knew what it was, but maybe they're just too embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> to ask, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, but but what's well, interesting, and it's it's something we all do all the time, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it, yeah. it's it's how you you. Well, I mean, there's some people that would even say that that's how things end up getting done. Mm. Is we think them into into existence in a sense, because yeah. you have to have the idea first, and then from there you you know what I mean. You yeah. hope if it's a good thing, if it's a bad thing, hopefully you, you suppress it. But anyway, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, basically uh, my, my songs are all about storytelling and uh, about trying to connect with people and in terms of telling them a story and seeing if they will relate to that story. And, yeah. um, you know, some people don't really listen to the words in music, but the, the, the people that I'm aiming to attract <laughs> are the ones who do, who, who like to hear a good story and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, it's it's definitely there is a rich tradition mm -hmm. of narrative songwriting. Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways that probably the first what became songs were mm -hmm. out of very much the sort of minstrel tradition. Right. Yeah. Which was all storytelling. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so it's not it's not surprising that it's such a such an important aspect, um, whether whether people listen to it or not, because I, I think it's sort of. We're 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 past the age of the singer songwriter in a sense, aren't we? Who were, who were uh, although it, way. it's always well, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I, I we're of, of the popularity. Let's say it's not to say that there are less of them, but the mm. popularity compared to let's say in the nineteen seventies when they were really the the focus of of so much. You mean you mean the kind of. Uh, singer with a guitar doing it, just kind of yes. um, folky kind of things. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, well, it wasn't necessarily. A lot of it was very pop as well. Yeah, yes, it was. It was. You know, it was very much the idea. Well, I think it came out of Dylan, probably, who was mm -hmm. you know, very influential, and then yeah, it came through this whole series of the the the, the Carol Kings, mm -hmm. the Joni Mitchells, and you know, yeah, well, Joni um, Joel, all of that. Yeah, well, that's why I don't really want to be kind of pigeonholed into one particular kind of genre is yeah. because I, I think that storytelling can go with any kind of music. So I really love, for example, um, um, some of the very electronic artists, but who who add a really strong element of storytelling into that, like some of the um, Kay Taylor and, and people like that. Um, okay. She's got some really interesting music and it's kind of spoken word but with really good kind of mm -hmm. music behind it as well no well it, it's it's an interesting point because i noticed i was sort of going through your discography and and listening to different things and as we were talking sort of before we started you, you've mm -hmm. been very prolific 
which is great in, in the last year. And I really noticed with the new record mm -hmm. that uh, it's definitely got more of an electronic bend. Yeah. Than, so, yeah. than your earlier stuff. It was very, very interesting and good. Uh, mm -hmm. And I definitely wanted to talk about that because I, I noticed it sort of, it started off, there were a bit more guitars. Yeah. And with this new one, I, I don't think I heard a guitar. I mean, there may have been, I might have missed a little bit or you might have had a treated one somewhere. No, uh, no, there are uh, a couple. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but very, you know, they, they let's say it's not guitar driven. No, not okay, at all, but, no. Yeah. But, um, but what was interesting to me is I noticed the bass work was excellent on it, mm -hmm. which Thank is you. interesting. So I'm assuming you play bass as well. It's actually done through a keyboard. It's, it's not all done, done on a bass. Keyboard. Okay, well, I was going to ask you, is it all MIDI? <laughs> is there anything that's not MIDI? But uh, yeah, no, yeah. but very, very strong bass lines. I mean, it was really... Uh... Yeah, it's something I've always liked to do is, is have quite melodic bass lines. Um, so... I don't own a bass guitar. Um, I, I wish I did. I would like, um, like uh, Joe Adamar, who produced my last mm -hmm. record. He um, <laughs> is not a great fan of my bass sounds when I do them through the keyboard. He, he thinks they sound a bit weedy, but, um, you know, I, he has very particular ear for, for what he likes to hear and other people don't always share exactly the same kind of opinion as him on everything, um, which is fine. You know, music's a very personal thing. And yeah, I know it, it, it's in terms of getting the best possible sounds. I think a live bass guitar would be brilliant. And I am going to invest in one at some stage, but um, at the moment I'm doing that part of it through MIDI. And yeah, yeah um, I do the drums all just like tapping it in through the, um the keyboard as well mm -hmm. uh, unless i use samples so there's a few drum samples on there and then there's a few which i programmed in myself so yeah it's, yeah uh, yeah i i, I use a, i use a similar method and in, in some ways i found like with the drums it, it work it can work quite well mm -hmm. and you can always fiddle around once it's in midi to, to yeah sort of in beat and you're not but but i i found sometimes just through sheer uh, I guess it's almost just sheer not knowing what you're doing. You sometimes come across with, <laughs> with ideas and rhythms that you yeah. that a drummer probably never would have thought of mm. because it's it sort of been taught out of them. In, yeah, in, well, I you know, yeah, I actually started out as a drummer. So, oh, okay, interesting. Um, when I first played in bands, age fifteen, I was a drummer, and um, so yeah. Um, yeah, I started behind the kit just as a drummer and then I started writing songs um, and halfway through university, I switched to playing guitar and uh, we were lucky enough to be able to find another drummer because they're always quite rare. Um, uh -huh. But I, yeah, we found another drummer, so I switched to playing guitar and um, yeah, haven't really looked back i had to sell my yeah. sold my drum kit so that i could buy the guitar and the amp and all that kind of thing so yeah fully yeah. switched and i miss playing the drums it's such a physical kind of uh, real yeah. gets I, and you you hadn't thought because it's it's something although i don't play i mm -hmm. i i thought i might do and i think if i have the space i might do at some point which is to get in a just to get an electronic kit yeah um I have played on a friend's um, electronic kit. They're not bad, but it, it doesn't have quite the same feel, feel. to me. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And I guess if you have a really expensive one, then the sensitivity is good and it, it sounds realistic and stuff. But... I guess it's the same thing as with a keyboard, getting one that's mm. fully weighted and all that, as opposed to, you know, the really cheap ones where they aren't, yeah. they have no feel at all. Yeah, if um, I had... Unlimited money, I would like get a proper soundproof studio with a drum kit and yeah. <laughs> big amps. Yeah, well, and, 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 you, and you'd and you'd buy the accompanying mansion, yeah, you know, the old mansion <laughs> out in the country with the perfect yeah. sound, right? With the big ballroom, yeah. yeah. Who yeah. wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. the staircase that had been rebuilt, so it was exactly the same acoustics as those <laughs> the, the drums on whichever Led Zeppelin album it yeah. was. <laughs> the, the fame what was it Led Zeppelin two? I'm trying to think which one. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, it's uh, no, it was very very interesting. And and what um, seeing that we're on it, what what uh, plugins are you using for your bass? Um, 
<laughs> you now you're asking. Um, well, I just I, I go through logic. Okay. Um, so that's the DAW that I use, yeah. and then um, just use mainly use the bass sounds on that, and then tweak it a little bit with um, I think they are Kramer ones. I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've had um, really good experience with native instruments. Yeah, I'm trying to get to grips with that, but I just I've downloaded it and it's no, I can't get it working yet. <laughs> well, it's, it's just the VST plugin. Yeah, I'm just so, so... I, I'm not quite sure how it would work with Logic, but uh, because mm -hmm. I I use um, I use Reaper, which mm -hmm. is I think very similar. And there, all it is is when you insert a track, there's a way to insert a track with mm -hmm. basically uh, with a virtual instrument. Yeah. And if you do that, and and you're you're set up in the back end so that your your keyboard is going to be getting a MIDI in and MIDI out, mm -hmm. then you just play it. It's, it's, it. I haven't had any problem. And I, I, the reason why I'm saying is that they've just got the native instruments, even the free stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of the of the sounds is just yeah. And, and well, there's one. It's like a, an upright bass, and I'll use that a lot. Yeah, I have not... I have used upright bass sound of, that's just in Logic quite a lot. Um, yeah, but the, this album was mostly recorded before I I downloaded that, so I haven't really okay. properly experimented with doing new stuff with it yet. So um, yeah, yeah, most of these songs have been kicking around since uh, last year or the end of this year. It just takes that long to kind of go from um, doing a draft version to to kind of tightening it up and and getting people to listen to them and say if they think it's good enough to go on the album and get yeah. a few other ears on it and then get it mixed and mastered and all that kind of stuff because all the I, fun stuff although yeah although i am a, a diy musician i'm really not great at all the technical aspects of it so i do need a bit of help sometimes no no wait listen i think it, it can add something as well that you wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily have if you're doing it all yourself yeah, definitely. Um, although, although that's not to say that sometimes you have the this vision in your your mind, and if you can achieve it on your mm -hmm. own, then fantastic. Yeah. Well, the big difference. Yeah, the big difference between this album and the last album is that the last album was produced by Joe Adama, so that meant that he actually had a a lot of input into how the song sounded. Yeah. And pulled apart. <laughs> all my ideas and then put them back together again. I was like, ah, um, it's kind of a, a painful process. Sometimes you have to get used to hearing your songs sounding completely different to how they were in your head to, to start with. So, um, yeah, this, this one has been very different because it's just been my vision. And the oh. only thing I've had where it's really changed has just been the final bit of tweaking with the mixing and making things sound right and yeah 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 all of that but yeah it's it's only me to blame for <laughs> how these songs sound this time i can't say no no it, yeah it sounded better before but then someone else messed around with it <laughs> oh, well, fair, fair enough no i i i haven't uh i haven't worked with anyone in terms of that i i've all done pretty well the production uh, mm -hmm. on my own so yeah I, I can i can imagine uh how strange it might be especially the first time you hear something after you've sort of given mm. all the stems to someone like joe yeah. who i actually I interviewed and i think his his episode will be coming on right before this one all um, right <laughs> next next week and then anyway it's of a mm -hmm. little interest anyone else uh but yeah no so I, I i i totally get that but it's quite quite interesting one one thing before i forget the base there's also another good free plugin that I use quite a bit and you might mm -hmm. like because it's it gives things a very like a, a synth base mm -hmm. uh, feel is is this free plugin called bass professor oh, okay uh, and and it's quite good because it allows you to really fine tune the the sound so if you want mm -hmm. more articulation or you want you know and it, it, it's 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 basically I think it's just like a mm -hmm. bass equalizer with some some effects in it, and I I've, I use that quite heavily yeah. for a lot of stuff because like you, 
uh, a lot of the the stuff that I did at a certain point was very base, like very lead base driven, mm -hmm. which I noticed with this latest thing. It's very much yeah. the sort of 80s, um, you know, that, that 80s sort of synth base lead type yeah. thing. You know. Yeah, I think um, yeah. You the next album, up, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I put out after this album is going to be another complete U-turn and uh, totally different again. So um, I'm Excellent. actually rehearsing with a, a fiddle player and oh, nice. singer. Um, so uh, yeah, it's uh, gonna, we're going to release uh, stuff as a duo called the Mist Trees, which is. Uh, the name given that so yeah i will no longer be a, a solo artist then i'll be uh, mm -hmm. doing things as a, a yeah a interesting duo. and is that one more uh, obviously with a fiddle player is it mm -hmm. is it more sort of folk roots um uh, well or alt folk i'm describing alt it uh, as yeah so um yeah it has all my kind of indie influences um but yeah louisa who i'm playing with um very much comes from a, a, a roots folk background so it's nice. this kind of combination that i think works really well that the, yeah. the blend of well, our two voices and, and definitely with narrative me. storytelling mm -hmm. uh it, it's it's definitely that's a style that that's very deeply rooted in that yeah definitely so um yeah we've actually got a gig which i'm doing before this album comes out so that's um at nice. this place which i've played before in in birmingham called artifact Oh, um, so yeah, cool. we're doing uh, a gig there, and we'll do a bit of solo stuff each, and then a set of eight or so songs together. So nice, nice. Yeah, and and because this album, I'm not going to do it live at all. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it would be like karaoke. I I just couldn't perform yeah. it really. No, I, I think I think you would have to do it with a band, mm. in a sense, um, and at least have like a, a drummer and either a bassist or other people playing keyboards where you've, you know, you've, yeah. seen, you've basically um, brought in the sounds so that you can actually play them or at yeah. least trigger them and look like you're playing. Them. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. It's weird, isn't it? When you, when you create music that, you know, you're not really going to be able to play live because music always used to be for me about, performing and, and playing it live and yeah. and this whole diy musician thing being at home just doing uh, on the computer is like it's, you're so disconnected from the audience in some ways but it just allows you the possibility to do things you could never have dreamed of doing before yeah. in yeah. terms of the, the the sounds you can create and the the yeah although i, I find although i find it fan i find it very fascinating to think of sort of strategies to be able to play some of the stuff live Mm -hmm. um, again, mattering on on what it is, because there's you know my my last EP was more like this one. It was more sort of '80s influence, more mm -hmm. electronic. Whereas the one I'm working on right now, I've I've also did a flip back, mm -hmm. and this one is much more. It's all MIDI, but yeah. it's based well, except for I, I'm I'm working I'm actually working with a guitarist uh, oh, and a right. couple of other musicians on this thing. Uh, but it's this is much more instrument based, even though mm -hmm. a lot of them are MIDI instruments. Yeah. So the thinking behind it is much more that, and that's what's driving the songwriting, as opposed mm -hmm. to the last one, which was sort of screwing around, finding an interesting sound that I yeah. liked, and then building a song or, you know, around that as the, one of the mm -hmm. hooks. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, I can understand that very well. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an interesting technique, and but but like yeah. you said, at, at that point, then it becomes much more difficult to do this live unless it's something that is you know mm -hmm. conceived of as live, and then you're going to need a band, and, and yeah, it becomes yeah. complicated, and then you get into all the all the mm -hmm. other issues. But uh, yeah, so with, with I, the... I really like playing acoustic though. It just it's. It's so raw and so kind of immediate. And so, yeah, with just me and one other person, mm -hmm. no need for a whole band and kind of amplification and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's, that's... And, and so are, are you going to be playing, is it going to be a six string then that you're playing or a 12 string acoustic? Or Yeah, just a six string acoustic. Um, yeah. yeah. And and is it nylon or, or steel string? Uh, steel, yeah. So I, it, I, it, I have both, but 
but my nylon string goes out of tune really quickly. <laughs> so I had a, a while, my, my steel string was really buzzing, so I took it off to be repaired and had to play on the nylon for a while. And um, some things are a little bit easier to play on it, but uh, overall, I definitely prefer the steel string to... Yeah, well, I think it's got yeah. a bigger sound, doesn't it? Mm, yeah. And, you know, more definitely. a more a bit of a more aggressive sound as mm. well. So it'll be interesting with with a fiddle player. And and are you are you thinking of at adding any percussion to this, or is it going to be solely? Um, not live. Uh, mm -hmm. Live, we're just sticking to being a, a duo because it's yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of rehearsals and stuff, just trying to get the two of us together is bad enough <laughs> let alone adding other people into the band so um yeah right. i think uh, the the sound is good enough for the two of us to to carry what we want to do um i think in terms of when we record um i've heard uh, a few other kind of folk influenced singer songwriters uh who do add in bits of other instrumentation in the uh, recorded versions of the songs which mm -hmm. aren't there in the live things and I think that's fair enough we might consider adding a few other textures in there but um, yeah I don't know yeah well, see how it goes I, I I don't know about you but I find that I, I'll let the song dictate mm. you know yeah a, lo a lot of the time anyway yeah I mean if I, well, if I if I hear something in a song then mm -hmm. I'll add it but I, I'm not necessarily, you know, it's a, like, I'm not necessarily saying I have to have that in that. Yeah, well, we want to get it really tight um, live first and really get to grips with how we feel the songs should sound mm -hmm. with what we have. And then, yeah, when we start laying them down uh on, in the as recorded material, then we can start think of, thinking about what else would in an ideal world kind of go with what's there already nice no, that's that's yeah. really good and so um are you are you planning on releasing a single for the for the for your new album first or how um, are you planning on rolling it out yeah so i've released three singles already uh off it okay. so the first one came out uh february i think it was that was okay. called a hundred doors which cool. is the first one on the album that you'd have listen yep. to uh with the creaky door at the start um yep. so yep. i i decided to put that one first on the album i think it's it in terms of the the sound and and stuff i thought it bridged the last album to this one quite well um because it wasn't too kind of loads of weird sounds and keyboardy bits it was just a fairly simple piano bit with um and it has a guitar solo in it as well <laughs> so <laughs> there was that slight bridge from from what came before yeah. before i launched into all the other ones um so yeah that one came out first and that got a really good reaction um so it won through in the indie 100 cup on in your ears radio and so um yeah it's been in the cool top 20 it got to number one in that kind of thing congratulations thank you yeah so yeah in the in the twitter sphere it's it's been in our little bubble of uh new indie musicians then it's it's done really well um obviously it's yeah not had thousands and thousands of uh of streams or anything but um yeah, in in terms of how people have reacted within the the audience that I get, yeah. it's yeah. been good. No good. Yeah, and then um, Joe Adamar, or rather not Joe Adamar, but the uh, the Invisible Squirrel remixed mm -hmm. one of the songs. Um, so that was called Trace. Yeah. That was the second one that came out last month. That um, was actually and... my first introduction to you. I was listening to it. Uh -huh. great remix, actually. It yeah, really yeah, worked very very well. And very different from the original, yeah. Mm hmm Because you heard that nicely so, though. Yeah, yeah. But you really you really heard Joe's influence mm -hmm. in it. And and how or the squirrel, think, rather. Yes, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I really like what Joe does both as a as a solo artist and a producer and yeah. uh, as a remixer as the Invis invisible squirrel. I think he's done some brilliant stuff. And um, yeah, my uh, my kids actually really love the uh, um, what's that track called? Nicholas Bloody Parsons off his <laughs> album, <laughs> the one with the really weird lyrics. And my my nine year old absolutely loves that video. I'll stick it on on YouTube and just sit there chuckling away at it. <laughs> oh, 
So you said that was the second. What was the what was the third single? So the third single came out uh, on Friday, and that's called Forgiveness Powder. Um, mm. And that one was the end. Uh, was mixed and mastered by a friend of mine in Russia because I lived oh, wow. over there for a, a long time. Uh, so I've got friends in the music sphere over there, and one of those is a, a sound engineer, and he he offered to do that for me as a favor, just kind of mixed and mastered it for me i think he did a really good job with the sound on it nice so that's the the fastest song i've ever released it's like 165 bpm <laughs> which is kind of like wow yeah drum and bass oh, that's, kind of. that's very fast yeah <laughs> although although i found it it's quite an interesting phenomenon with music that you can have a song that let's say at 135 mm -hmm. that doesn't seem very fast yeah and another one in the like nineties mm -hmm. that seems more driving. Yeah, or it's all, very weird. Yeah, it's all about the rhythm, rhythmic bits that you put into it, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, and and I guess how many times? I mean, especially when you get away from having like your kick going on mm -hmm. beat, yeah, it yeah. becomes less noticeable, and then it it's much more how you rhythm, how you structure the rhythm. Yeah, well, this has yeah. kind of a, a a drum and bass kind of feel to the drums a little bit yeah um but it it's also got kind of arpeggiators on the keyboard so that's all going kind of mad going tuk -tuk 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 -tuk. yeah so yeah it feels fast as well as being yeah. fast and, yeah um, well it, well those drum and bass are are fast they've always had that yeah. very, that very fast drum sound so that makes perfect sense yeah but in terms of having then a, a storytelling songwriter singing over the top of it it sounds yeah very very different from a drum and bass uh kind of style in in terms of that so it's a, a a bit of a mix yeah and i had to yeah work at getting all the, the lyrics to fit in quite well <laughs> I, was, I was gonna i was gonna say i mean you really have to it was probably one that you'd you'd practiced your lyrics a lot more than you would otherwise just yeah to get and, right. well yeah partly and and just trying to get the timing right so um when i found when my mate was mixing it um I was listening to the chorus. I was like, hang on, the, it all sounds out of time a little bit. And somehow that there was a bit of latency in there. I don't know. And, and the, the vocals had kind of slipped off the beat a bit. So he yeah. was able to rectify that. I didn't have to re-record it again, but yeah, there's amazing things these sound engineers can do with kind of getting things back in time. <laughs> you slipped a bit and, yeah. and that kind of thing. And, so yeah. yeah well um, there's there's also features in the daw that allow you to to do it but yeah, yeah. So sometimes i've noticed as well like especially if you're doing uh music where you're you're cutting and pasting a lot mm -hmm. uh there's a greater chances that this you sort of have that that the 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 rhythm goes out yeah by by just imperceptible little things but a minute along, it starts becoming very perceptible. Mm, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and then you're wondering what, the, why is yeah, but no, yeah. Very cool. Well, there's there's all kinds of imperfections in in my recordings, but it, it, I don't want to kind of iron out every single one. Sometimes I just think, yeah, I it's, it's I better. think that that's what makes that that's what gives music character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, personally, and I I myself I I look for them and I'll lean into them. Mm -hmm. unless they're really awful like you know something <laughs> well i mean no but there's a di listen there's dif difference between a mistake that's a good mistake yeah and one that you don't want to have to listen to again mm -hmm. and those yeah, ones yeah. you get rid of and hope hope that no one else ever heard it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but some of them some of them you know i i've i've, I've had songs where i've worked something like that and it's become a hook mm -hmm. You know, because there's something about it that, you know, it, again, because it's, I think it, it, for me anyway, it's, 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 does it excite your ear? Yeah. And, and that's the only judge. If something excites my ear, I don't care what key it is. I don't care if I've broken some rule. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and you lean in to see if you can't, can't make it better. Yeah. So, well, um, I have a few friends with kind of, much more of a, a a classically trained background than me in terms of music and and they'll be listening to it and 
picking out a kind of what chords it is. And I'm like, I've got no idea. <laughs> so they say, when you play this chord, I'm like, really? Did I yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what, um, why did why did you play the flat, you know, the the, the, the flat rather than this? And it's like, <laughs> I have no idea because I played it and it sounded good. Yeah, you that's know? that. I do everything by ear. I don't yeah. uh, use theory to write songs with. I just use emotion and sound and, and what yep. sounds good I, to me so yeah same i i'm completely un, untrained i mean I, I i tried learning piano and i can mm -hmm. come up you know i can make i can i can play some chords mm -hmm. and i can figure out things from there and i can pick mm -hmm. out little melodies and, and things like that but that's about as as far as it goes yeah no i've i've always been good at picking things out by ear but um yeah in terms of if you tell me to play a particular thing, then I have to look it up to, to know what it is generally. Um, yeah, although I, I have to say, I find it interesting to sort of study and learn uh, learn chords. Mm -hmm. Because there are some, especially some of the jazz chords and things like that. Yeah. That just wonderful. Well, uh, there, are, you know. there are some really good YouTubers who who do bits of music theory, and, and I have been watching some of those to, to kind of broaden my knowledge base a little bit and and try and work out in a way what it is that i'm doing so that, I, so that i know which kind of tropes i've been using and and um yeah which to avoid and so 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 tell me uh how how do you generally write songs do you start with lyrics do you no start i always start music yeah i write lyrics to the music um okay. so i it, it may not be a fully uh written song to start with it might just be uh Nonsense one lyrics. riff one yeah um one part and i write the the lyrics for that and then i come up with the rest of it but it's always i never write lyrics and then write music for those lyrics cuz i i can't do it that way around i have to fit the lyrics onto something and have some kind of feeling that those lyrics go with so for example like with forgiveness powder um, the single that came out this week. Um, well, it won't be this week when this goes out, but it is when I'm talking to you. Um, so I was I was speaking to someone on Twitter about it. Um, I lost and... Joe for a second. Ooh. Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, he seemed to be back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, I was saying uh, with forgiveness powder, the one that we've been talking about, the really fast one. Um, so I was telling somebody on Twitter what the story was about. So it's about this woman called Mary Blandy, mm -hmm. who uh, was in her 30s and she was still single. And um, so her dad was offering this £10,000 dowry for the suitable husband and stuff. And then this very unsuitable chap comes along. He's a, a gambler and uh, is actually married already. And <laughs> when they find out, they're trying to get rid of him. But um, she'd kind of fallen in love with him already. and And then he didn't want to give up on this possibility of marrying her and getting the dowry. So he was trying to persuade her to give this, her dad this magical forgiveness powder, which if he took it, then he would forgive him and that they could live happily ever after. And it was actually arsenic. And so she gave it to him and <laughs> killed the dad and then got hanged for it. And then everyone lived unhappily ever after. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy who's telling this story. What a happy said, story! <laughs> yeah, it's delightful. You know, it's a real pop song, isn't it? No, um, so. But yeah, he was going. I would have put that over some kind of real kind of minor chords, very mm -hmm. slow kind of um, yeah melancholy piece, and you've done it over this really fast one. And I was like, yeah, but that was kind of. I felt this all went really quickly and she got carried away in the, the, what was happening and, and didn't really think too much. So I always kind of put that into it. Yeah. And when I wrote the music first, it was just called mega fast. That was my, what I saved it as when I first wrote the music and then just took me a while to work out what words to go with it and went with those in the end. Yeah. It's just one of those stories that I came across in terms of like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I I know I know exactly. Uh, before I I ever wrote any songs myself, mm -hmm. I I was in a number of bands, and of course at that point I would write lyrics without mm -hmm. having music in mind, and then fit the lyrics mm -hmm. to the music. 
So that makes perfect sense as a way to do it because you you know all at least I would know almost immediately whether whether I could do something with the lyrics, you know? Yeah. Well, because it's, all, it's because a lot of them, I, I don't know about you, but I, I find like with, with lyrics, I'll, I'll, you'll get the phrase. Mm -hmm. Like there'll be a phrase that'll start a song oftentimes or a title. Uh, um, I used I used to do it like that, but um, yeah. I I found that the songs started getting a bit kind of samey and, and there wasn't enough substance in them for me okay. when okay. I was writing songs like that. And I wanted songs that, meant a bit more mm -hmm. so that's why i've very much gone down this kind of storytelling route and being yep. very clear what it is i'm writing a song about first so my my technique for writing lyrics now is that um i will before i start writing the lyrics i um will write lots of bits about what i'm going to write about not mm -hmm. in lyric form and then start molding that into yeah the right sized bits to go into verses yeah. and choruses not always choruses sometimes there aren't any, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well because because at, at some point uh no matter what what you're doing you have to the the phrasing has to work yeah yeah if you're if you're going to be doing lyrics if you're going to be singing mm -hmm. yeah and i find that once you know once i know how many syllables are going to be in a phrase mm -hmm. it, it's then quite easy to fit almost anything in uh there are tricks of course you know but you you know you don't necessarily have to rhyme exactly at the end of of something no. yeah you know, but you have but if it has a different number of syllables it's never going to sound properly yeah i i do tend to cram too many in sometimes <laughs> it's just yeah one of those things i just have so much to say sometimes it's like oh, i'm no, trying to make me <laughs> get it all in there <laughs> listen, listen there's absolutely nothing nothing wrong with that that's why we're all doing it right yeah yeah it's, i mean it's all about it's all about the self-expression to a certain degree yeah but some songwriters are very sparse with the amount of words they use and others try and fit a lot in and yeah i i veer between the two a bit but i tend to be more in the kind of yeah i have too many words and i have to take some out to make it fit kind of thing rather than yeah. So the, the the ball you fall on the Bob Dylan side of the scale. Yeah, probably. I think he always had <laughs> way too many words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've tried doing some of his songs, and sometimes you just think, "Wow, he's <laughs> got so many." No, words. He, was, he was a more talented singer than people give him credit for. Yeah. You know, he might not have always been in key, <laughs> uh, but he was he was quite a wordsmith and well he was a great wordsmith but oh, yeah. you know, it was also quite amazing how many words he could fit into a phrase mm -hmm. and get them to work you yeah. know and, and stuff like that so mm -hmm. yeah it was it was it was interesting i i saw just as an aside i saw a documentary of the basement tapes which yeah. were the the sort of dylan heads that's the, the big thing and that mm -hmm. that the, the whole story behind that's quite fascinating yeah you know with the band and what the the what was it the the big pink the house that they were in <laughs> well and the fact that he sort of reinvented himself during that whole period and you know and basically mm -hmm. was the impetus behind that whole americana movement that started because you know it was just it was weird it was weird that the americana thing was really a band of canadians <laughs> and levon elms yeah right? yeah yeah but uh, but anyway, it's, uh, but it's, it's interesting because it, according to them, he came in and it was all just about this American songbook mm -hmm. that he was he was totally um, at the time he was totally sort of obsessed with. Yeah, and so they, with all these old folk songs, he'd bring in and then they'd try to work out arrangements for them. Yeah, well, I've always been like that, which is all all quite. It was just a very interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always found. Um solo artists who kind of reinvent themselves all the time really fascinating so you've got your dylan and um uh, bowie. bowie particularly as is someone i get compared to sometimes which is extremely flattering i don't think i'm anywhere near that interesting but um yeah yeah he's somebody and uh, i listened to a lot of prints when i was growing up as well so i 
I hear bits of Prince influence mm-hmm. in some of the kind of stuff that I write, but uh, I don't know if anyone else would pick up on that. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, and I, yeah, I don't obviously pretend to be anything like any of these megastars who have those kind of very manufactured personas that they kind of control really, really rigorously. But in terms of just trying to reinvent yeah what i'm doing musically and yet keeping my particular kind of style and songwriting style but just going through different genres that's that's something that i find interesting experimenting with well i mean listen one thing i i wouldn't i wouldn't sort of discount what what you're doing just in the sense that you have the drive Mm -hmm. and and if i've looked at any of the very successful musicians like you look at their histories they're they're prolific Mm-hmm. they're willing to learn they're constantly doing new things yeah you know uh and and they have i mean not everyone has the natural talent of someone like prince mm-hmm. who yeah. is, is is able no well, think of it, it it boggles the mind right he's i know i know yeah. he's 17 years old and he can actually record all the instruments mm-hmm. compose everything and produce an album yeah yeah, yeah. at 17 yeah I mean, it, it, you know when, when when you think back i don't know about you but when i was 17 <laughs> you know? yeah i mean i was i was a drummer in a band age 17 and, and yeah. i was i was experimenting with writing lyrics um i wasn't able to play guitar very well at that stage but yeah but yeah i mean musician wise he was a prodigy he yeah, was a yeah. child prodigy you know, just, just, just like uh, little Stevie Wonder. Yeah, yeah. Very, they're, they're quite similar one to the other in a sense. Mm-hmm. Stevie Wonder was the same thing. He also could play everything. Yeah. In many of his records, it's all just him. Yeah. In and, you studio. know, I, I, could, I could now record a record where I played the drums, I played the bass, I played guitar, yeah. and I, I can kind of <laughs> kind of do the keyboards. But um, uh, on this album where I've done the keyboards, it's been doing it bit by bit rather than playing it live obviously so uh, yeah. yeah if i had to play keyboards live on stage that would be a bit bit more of a challenge for me <laughs> i think i certainly no prince well, but, but but see that that's that's why you have a band yeah. and why you hire someone who sings really well like really good background singer who can play keyboards mm-hmm. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all yeah. purpose of it no it's uh no it's very very interesting so so you started out as a drummer. Mm-hmm. Uh, what? Why did you decide to change over to 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 guitar? What was it? Was it just you got sick of lugging the drum drums around? Because, <laughs> out of all the instruments, that has to be the one that that needs the most dedication, in a sense. Because you're, well, you're on, and a vehicle. Yeah, a vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up in the in the sticks, like. Um, when I had to go to band practices, it was like a seven mile drive across the little country road, yeah. roads to get there. Um, so like my dad would drive me around until I passed my driving test, which was like a few months after my 17th birthday, because I was desperate to do so because I needed my independence. Um, but yeah, so yeah, drums are really hard work <laughs> in terms of shifting them around, but it's also really physically hard to drum and sing so um so my uni band i was the lead singer as well as the drummer um and i was writing all the lyrics at that stage um and i was writing some of the guitar parts um for the guitarists but they were playing them and then adding their own bits to it as well right writing writing their own stuff as well um so yeah it it just (sighs) It was really hard work drumming and singing, and people look at the band and they're like, "Where's the singer?" kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so yeah, it just felt like I wanted to be the front man. Um, yeah, well, and, that, that would make sense. Look, even Phil Collins yeah. right, ended up doing <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <clears throat> yeah. So. Yeah, that's my least favorite person to be <laughs> compared to. <laughs> as to you, you know what? I would totally agree. I, I listen. I grew up. I was a big, big Genesis fan. 
Mm. And it, it took me uh, a fair bit to get over the, the, the sort of loss of Peter Gabriel, because that's mm -hmm. where I fell in terms of my Genesis fandom. But yeah. over, over, the, over the, I have to say, first off, I hate to say it, but Phil Collins, a lot of the vocal parts on those early records that I like the most, he was mm. the one singing them because mm. he had a better voice. <laughs> you know? he, oh, he, he was wow. not he was not the most inventive singer mm -hmm. right and i'm sure half the time the lines were lines he was harmonizing yeah. with or were lines that he took over that peter gabriel had probably come up with mm -hmm. but he was he was an excellent singer mm -hmm. like his voice was excellent and you know, and and he had a very successful career. I mean, what happened with Genesis? And it's it's not my kind of music, but no. But you know, it's you can't. It's like Sting. I have the same sort of ambivalent feelings about Sting. Mm. You know, yeah. very talented. He was driven enough to do it. He did it later in life. A lot of people don't know, but he had already. I think he was a school teacher or something. Yeah, yeah. He was sort of in late twenties. Was that now, that time I, where I he had to? to Mm -hmm. I used to listen to The Police a lot when I was yeah. young. And um, they were a great band. They were really they good. Were, yeah, Stuart Copeland is an amazing yeah. drummer. Well, he, he had gotten <laughs> two really good musicians with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the yeah. whole band, the whole band, it would never have been successful without Sting. No, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and, and his voice, and yeah. he had a very unique voice, and that was yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Sting's solo career, on the other hand, it's mm, anyway. Yeah. Let's I, think he, he over, <laughs> I think he overstepped his talent. Is yeah, what I definitely. Would, I would say, but but yeah. that's just me and you know my very ambivalent feelings about jazz. Mm. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm. <laughs> yeah, when I'm it's like... good, it's good, and when it isn't, oh boy. Yeah, um, jazz, like any form of music, has its place, and um, yeah, I the best jazz is just like really kind of jazz musicians who love playing it and just really get into it and just do their own thing. I think um, like classical and, and opera and things like that, it doesn't really belong in the, the kind of pop side of things. So when, when there's people trying to cross it over with that, I think that's when it doesn't really work. True, true. Although there've been some very successful ones in all. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the greats were the greats. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. With me, I found with jazz, it's a funny thing because I think that up until sort of bebop, like the, the sort of swing era and that, it was that then it was really pop music. Mm -hmm. It was sometimes yeah. very complicated pop music, very sophisticated mm -hmm. pop music, but it was pop music. And then the bebop that, that broke things in a yeah. sense. And the geniuses in it were truly geniuses. And I'll still listen to, to the, you know, like the classic records because they're there really. It's. It's an experience anyone who likes music should should mm. have. Yeah, but but anyone who what didn't have the chops, uh, you it's noticeable almost immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what I, I you know, mm -hmm. even with my limited understanding of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, no, that's so so. It, it's interesting what what is the impetus behind the sort of veering off towards folk music? Is it just the enjoyment of playing live, like you were saying before, or is it, you know, um, a secret sort of Jethro Tull fan? Or... <laughs> yeah. Folks never been my thing particularly, despite kind of liking sitting, strumming a, um, an acoustic, um, and liking certain bits of kind of Dylan and 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 some of the more popular um, songwriters, but yeah, it it was wanting to play with somebody else, and and I just I've known Louisa for a number of years, and she's got an amazing voice, and she's a really good fiddle player, and she, it's just happens that she's not playing with anyone else at the moment, and um, yeah, so we we played together for the first time last summer. I just said, I'm doing this concert. Would you mind doing a few songs with me? Do you fancy trying it out? Mm -hmm. So we did a few songs last year and then she's been really busy work-wise. So we've just been waiting for that to settle down a bit. And I was, had these other albums to put out. And so uh, got those out of the way. And then I thought, right, I'm going to focus on 
doing some uh yeah stuff with her so we've been rehearsing for a uh, last few months um yeah so we've got nine ten songs kind of Great. pretty pretty well on the way to being ready to perform which is good because the gigs in <laughs> on the 9th of july so yeah we got so and are they all originals or are you doing any yeah covers? yeah at the moment it's all originals um we've got a few ideas for covers bouncing around that we might try doing so um there's one she wants to do which is called pound a week rise which is um one that's done by a few folkier kind of artists and then i fancy doing uh, a cover of driving on nine which was um uh performed by the pixies on the the last splash album but it was a re- that was actually a cover um by a, a band called ed's redeeming qualities i think they're called um and which i wasn't aware of but once i started looking at it um i've i've heard their version too and it's really interesting how kind of different it is but has the similarities and and it's got a really good fiddle part and so that's why it kind of works for us to try no no covering it, it, it. it it's interesting but i mean the other thing i noticed as well is sometimes crossovers uh if the strong is if the song is strong enough mm-hmm. if it's a well-written song it'll carry yeah. it all no matter what style yeah. it's played in well another one I've... Some very interesting effects with songs that you know they mm. become you know where you're used to it like heavy guitars let's say an acdc song yeah when it's transposed mm-hmm. into something else if, if it's a good you know song the, re- the results are sometimes spectacular yeah well i really. don't know if you've spotted but on twitter i i do quite a lot of acoustic covers as well um so there's this hashtag that um a few of us use called murdered song of the day which is a bit kind of <laughs> sung in cheek so we all just kind of um post our acoustic covers of various different um songs on there so yesterday for example it was paul mccartney's birthday and so i did a a version of got to get you into my life so yep. i had to change that up quite a lot to do it just acoustic um i slowed it down a bit and kind of yeah i think I really enjoyed doing that. It worked quite well. I've done all kinds of different things. I did a Barry Manilow song the other day as well. Which um, one? Mandy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, that pulled a lot of records. That was a yeah. really good in its day. Well, it, it was, he's a, he's a year younger than Paul McCartney. It was his 79th birthday on Friday. So, wow. Uh, and he was playing in Birmingham, so I thought I'd just <laughs> give that a go. Well, but he's kept but, yeah. he's kept at it. You know, you got to get, yeah, them, yeah. You know, it's what one of those. Like, what was the other one? Neil Diamond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other yeah. one. But he wrote, he wrote a number of good songs. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back, back, back in the day, mm-hmm. before his foray. I don't know if you remember Radio Shack. No, I'm I, I familiar with that. It over to <laughs> Europe. It was sort of pre-electronic. That's where you'd get all your mm-hmm. electronic stuff. You know, the people who would fiddle around with the diodes and, and right, all that. and then they started. They started. They were early purveyors of things like VHS players, mm-hmm. and they had their own brand and whatever. And for whatever reason, they went into music at some point and decided they were going to become a record company. Uh huh. And the artist they chose was Neil Diamond. All oh, right, okay. And I can't remember what recording it was, but they pressed a lot of copies of that. Yeah, I don't think they sold that many of them, so they were around for a long time. Oh, okay, <laughs> it was just one of these one of these weird things where it's like, how you know? It was, yeah. It's like these these weird sponsorship deals that happen sometimes with companies mm. and artists. Yeah, and you wonder how that how the heck did that ever come about? Yeah, it's just one of these you know one of these ones. It's I weird, isn't it? How much, or, anyway? Yeah, how much money gets pumped into certain things, and then other people have got absolutely nothing. And yeah. They just get by on. Well, it and oftentimes, you know what it is? It, it's the the owner of the company or the president mm. or whatever. He's totally interested. It was like it was interesting when I was talking with Joe. There was a situation like that um, with this band called I don't know if you know them, Silver Silver Apples. Mm. It's really weird New York based like 60s electronica uh-huh. before electronica existed. Yeah. And the guy, the main guy behind it had gone and bought these World War II oscillators 
<laughs> they used literally they were using i don't know yeah. if signals or whatever and there was all uh -huh. these surplus ones kicking around mm -hmm. that you could buy cheaply and so he had all these oscillators and he was making the music with the oscillators so it was like really hardcore he had his own setup it was before yeah. moog before there were really any synthesizers mm -hmm. at all and for yeah. some and for some reason the mayor of new york city at the time i think his name was lindsay I don't know the Ted, I can't remember mm. the, the, his first name. He took a liking to it. So right. they played a live show that was synchronized with the moon landing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can imagine how that came. It, like, and yeah. this was stuff, you know, this is stuff that if you if you heard it today, mm. it wouldn't sound out of place. Yeah. In some very sort of electronic, uh, you know, mm. like like really sort of yeah and how that's how did it happen well obviously he knew someone or someone knew yeah. someone or whatever that that it you know got known and then they the second album they they did it and the the whole cover art destroyed their career all right it was the strangest thing they they had a cover mm -hmm. and the the front is them in the cop cockpit of like a jumbo jet mm -hmm. and the back was a plane crash oh and the company i think it was pan am or one of the big companies who that who had you know allowed mm -hmm. them to take the shots then basically suppress the record all right okay <laughs> yeah. they didn't want the connection with with flying and crashes right? no that's not a good business model is it and and so they basically they suppressed and i don't think the album you know it's probably worth mm. a fortune because maybe there were 100 copies that got out yeah yeah the, they destroyed them all, right? <laughs> so they actually burnt them, did they? Oh no, I, I think they they actually convinced the record company, and they they actually mm. they junked the records. Right, I okay. think it was one of yeah. just crazy, crazy stories. And that was the end, and no one ever heard about them. And then, yeah, thirty what a years waste. later, <laughs> thirty years later, someone brings up the you know a dusty yeah. copy and discovers it, and the rest mm. is is history. And I think now they're playing again. Yeah sort of thing but uh yeah it's 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 funny it's a funny funny world like that so um let me think so you're playing live you got the album coming out july mm -hmm. the 22nd that's right yeah uh band cam yeah so yeah. um the previous album i put it out on band camp first mm -hmm. and held off the streaming release for a, f a few months uh but this time i'm just going to put it out everywhere at the same yeah. time but people who buy it on camp band camp will get a uh, a downloadable lyric book <laughs> so i've um, been creating that this morning i was uh, putting that nice. all together and a design package to try and do a good job of like having all the lyrics there for people yeah. so they can read along while they're listening if they want to yeah well let's see the way, way we all used to do it right yeah yeah with, yeah. The, with the album and you know yeah cuz i i just i'm not going to produce physical records it's just not something i'm interested in doing i mm -hmm. don't buy them myself and it just seems like more plastic that the world doesn't need really i'm mm -hmm. um, <laughs> i know there are a lot of people who are into it but just because that's the kind of um environmentalist background that i come from i, I work for friends of the earth and you know yeah oh, i don't do it anymore but yeah that's i come from this campaigning background and i'm very mm. into kind of climate matters and all that and so yeah i just don't want to create more stuff really no listen more more power to you it's mm. you know as, as long as you walk the walk i have nothing you know what i mean <laughs> yeah nothing that i'll say for or against it uh, <laughs> but, uh no no yeah. I mean, but i think that that's the important thing you know, if yeah, you were if you sure. were at, at home and your house was just filled with all kinds of stuff, and you're, you're <laughs> you know, you're moralizing about it, and not living it, that's a different. Mm. Then then I'd have more issues with it. Yeah, so, I mean, so, I've, so I've still got all my is, CDs your, from earlier. <laughs> yeah, well, we all we all use did, them anymore, right? Yeah. I have I, I I've got a bunch, and I I don't listen to physical yeah. stuff anymore either. And I'm just wondering what to do with them. Like, yeah, they're just in a box upstairs. Through the rest of them. <laughs> um. But but tell me, I'm 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 interested because with my new release, I'm I'm still trying to think think how I'm going to do it, and mm -hmm. uh, I think I may actually 
choose the option to have a have a physical option or at least do one of their indiegogo style campaign type things yeah sure um did did you find though releasing only on bandcamp and then and then streaming did you find that was advantageous or was it something um is that the reason why you've changed over for this time was it based on based on bad experiences you had or it wasn't a particularly bad experience but it dragged mm -hmm. it out a lot longer <laughs> i was kind yeah. of getting a bit trying to do the promotion twice i mean doing it once is uh, uh enough yeah. hard work really but i just want yeah. to move on to the next thing as well okay um, so yeah I, I i mean i sold a few copies of the the album last time and i'm really grateful to people who actually paid to listen to the music made much yeah. more money on bandcamp than i've yeah. made in through well, what is it 90 percent that you get back i think it's a really high rate mm -hmm. isn't it yeah, yeah yeah so and i just thought well this time i'm gonna try doing it differently so just to see if it makes any difference and give something away that doesn't actually cost much, but it, it shows that there's a bit of love put into the release yep. and, and people can download this thing that feels a bit special because it's only available to people who buy it on Bandcamp. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'll just see how that goes. And, you know, it's all just experimenting, isn't it? I don't have the answers on how to do this successfully, yep. how to, you know. Well, well, and that, and that's why I'm asking. I'm, I'm just yeah. fascinated to see what people's experiences are mm -hmm. to, to learn from them. And hopefully yeah. viewers will learn learn as well because yeah. we're we're all experimenting and mm -hmm. I think the more we share the information, yeah, uh, the better it will be. And I mean the other the other thing is any way we can help support Bandcamp that mm -hmm. gives us a much better deal, we should all be actively doing. Yeah, that. definitely. Yeah. Because yeah. out of all out of all the options, it's probably by far the best. Mm -hmm. But it, it tends to get forgotten. It does, yeah, and which is, which is unfortunate. I mean, part of it is the fact yeah. that they're, they're still back in the 1990s with their website and their their, well, their yeah. end of it. But that's a whole other issue, right? Yeah. Because, well, I think just things that people have said, like um, playlisting and and things like that, which Bandcamp could do a lot better to so that people could share their music with other people and and, and yeah. draw them in. I think would would be a really yeah, well, I, because I think that many of us would like to get off the all the streaming services. Mm. I, I yeah, don't yeah. think anyone's had a really good experience with it. The money's terrible. Mm -hmm. They don't treat us very well, as we we all know from John Mitchie's. Yeah, Mickey, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, following that very closely, and you know, and, you know it's, yeah. and, and it, it's just continuing on, and it's not surprising. Yeah. It leaves a bit of a nasty taste in the mouth. Yeah, you know, yes, yeah. but listen, everyone is in the same the same boat. Yeah. I, I think the, the the thing that's most shocking is what was I was, I was watching something and they had a stat about um, about Spotify where I think there's only 90, 90 k artists who make mm -hmm. more than ten thousand dollars. Wow, okay, year. yeah, and and when you think about it, that includes mm -hmm. all the biggies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's no one. Mm. No, I mean, making much money. No, well, if if it weren't for Spotify, then uh, no, hardly anyone would have heard my music. That's the thing, because yeah, that's where it gets listened to. Um, I don't make any money through it, but yeah, some of the people who've heard it first on Spotify will then go to Bandcamp. It's small numbers, but the only unfortunately that is the the streaming platform of choice that everyone goes to and i'm trying to push apple more because i prefer that and you get paid a bit more but yeah still not huge amounts but um yeah in terms of where all the indie playlisters are that's all all still on spotify and so that's where you put a bit of effort into tr trying to get people to hear what you've made no, and, and, and you, you're making music for people to hear it in the end, aren't you? So you can't just yeah. boycott it and, and like the no, big no, no, stars. No, no. <laughs> Although it would be nice. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and nice. I, I'm really, I'm really hoping that Bandcamp does something to, you know, mm. to increase, increase, increase its influence because it definitely is a better deal for us. Yeah, definitely. I would love Bandcamp to really kind of take off a bit more and and f 
for more people to use that as their their service of choice um yeah. and and for them to find a model that works for mass participation from listeners and cuz you know i i try not to bombard the people who <laughs> subscribe to me on bandcamp with too many uh messages yeah. but um cuz i get a bit annoyed by some of the ones on there who send too much stuff out. It's just like, when I've got something out, I'll send it out. And then yeah. you are sending a message direct to the people. Yeah. Who, well, unfortunately they're all, they're all following coaching and doing what they they're, they're told is, is going to yeah. make them successful. And yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and we get to live with the, uh, the results yeah. of it. Right. I'll yeah. Be, it's like, I really one on one coaching. Yeah, well, I really don't like the uh, the artists who will send you a DM as soon as you've followed them as well, and it's like saying, "Listen to this." this you know. yeah. Look, if I followed you, I will get around to try to listen to your stuff at some stage. If you send me a DM telling me to, I definitely won't, and I might yeah. unfollow. You. No, it's, it's, it's quite quite true. <laughs> so, so yeah. listen before I let you go. I've always got one question I ask at the okay. end. Um, what was the first physical? Because I, mm -hmm. I know you're old enough, so I, you're probably you're Thank probably you. been old enough. What was the what was the first record that you yeah. bought? Uh, money. Um, um. Well, the first single I got. That's I'm fair. not sure if I bought it, but or I asked to be given it was okay. Um, well, all right, that 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 counts too. <laughs> was Green Door by Shaken Stevens. And how old were you at the time? Uh, six or seven, I think. Um, and the first album that I got was Complete Madness. That was, um, yeah, that was a madness compilation. I think. Um, and that's one I would still very happily listen to, to today. I think they're brilliant songwriters and I really enjoy listening to them. And, you know, they're not given quite as much credit as they should do, I think, in terms of how good they are. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, was that your was that your sort of first musical obsession? Was it the two tone stuff, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really liked two tone, so madness and specials and and all that kind of stuff was yeah. um, around a lot when I was at, at that kind of impressionable age. Um, also, stuff like um, yeah, Frankie goes to Hollywood and and um, Nick Kershaw, some of those kind of synthy based kind of mm -hmm. singer songwriters in the early 80s but yeah. things i started listening to as well quite seriously when i was getting into music on my own kind of thing yeah yeah and then yeah prince came later and then came all the indie stuff and yeah pixies was the first kind of okay proper alternative band that I, I i listened to and really was like blown away by i thought wow that's really different no, it's it's always I always find it fascinating, you know, and uh, mm. and and for for me it's interesting because all my early stuff that I bought was all super poppy, mm -hmm. you know, it's like Captain and Tennille. They had one great they had one great song. You probably <laughs> wouldn't. and I bought the album for the song. I was very disappointed. It was a good yeah. learning experience of being careful with albums <laughs> you buy, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, great single, and to this day, it's a great single. Uh, what was it? Love will tear us. Love will keep us together. Or love will tear us. I think it's love will keep. Love will keep us together. Yeah, not love will tear us apart. That's no, love will tear us apart. <laughs> I, I like that one too. But, uh, that, that that came a little bit later, right? Yeah. You know, but uh, anyway, great. Thank you, Joe. We're Thank you, Martin. Here. Yeah. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your your day. And, yes, thanks. Uh, you too. Exactly, and get get back to your kids, and uh, yeah, can you hear them banging? Around yeah, that's like, totally fine. <laughs> it's, it's Sunday; they're excited. You're probably yeah, gonna go yeah. do something and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. How, how's the weather out there? Uh, yeah, it's all right. It was um, it was very wet yesterday, but it's um, been drier today, so that's better. Nice. Anyway, good luck with the launch. Cheers. Uh, we'll uh, we'll try to get together and and touch base after it's happened or something like that. You can give me yeah, cool, great. Anyway, thank you so much. Stay online, and we'll we'll say our formal goodbyes. Okay, brilliant. Anyway, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.